Well, hi, everybody. This is Don Stewart. Welcome to Angels, God's Invisible Messengers. We're on episode number 25 right now. We're going to answer the question number 35, should people worship angels? Now, when angels have appeared on the pages of Scripture, they're often very impressive looking people, large of stature, having clothing described as dazzling. Now, because of this imposing appearance that people see, there's the tendency that we find in Scripture for people to worship angels. So here's the question. Is it legitimate to do this? Should we ever worship angels? Now, the answer is a resounding no. We're never to worship angels. Though they're impressive-looking beings, angels should never, ever be worshipped. Since God created angels as spirit beings to minister to his people, they are not worthy to be worshipped. In fact, the Bible warns us against such practices. All right, let's look at some examples. Number one, John was told not to worship an angel. There are two incidents in, two incidents in the book of Revelation when the apostle John was rebuked when he attempted to worship an angel. We read the following in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. John says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said, No, don't worship me, for I am a servant of God, just like you and other brothers and sisters who testify of their faith in Jesus. Worship God, for the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. That's Revelation 19.10. Now, this angel made it clear that only God is worthy of our worship. Indeed, we should never worship angels. Now, on another occasion, John again attempted to worship an angel. This is also recorded in the book of Revelation, and this is in the last chapter, chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. John says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. That's Revelation 22, 8 and 9. And you couldn't say it more clearly, could you? Only God is to be worshipped. No other being is worthy. Now, one thing we do find out from Scripture is that angel worship was practiced at the time of the New Testament, uh, writing of the New Testament. Now, it seems that it was practiced at the time Paul wrote to the Colossians because he mentions the worship of angels in his letter to the Colossians, chapter 2 and verse 18. And here's what he says. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking. That's Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18. Now, Paul forbade believers to be engaged in such conduct. Now, we don't fully understand the background of his statements here in Colossians chapter 2. Several observations can be made. Number one, these people had experienced visions. The people who were engaged in angel worship had experienced visions. They were dwelling, what they were doing is dwelling on what these visions had told them. In fact, the Bible actually warns believers of angels appearing to them. Paul wrote this to the Galatians in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, and could not be more clear. Please listen carefully. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach another gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. That's Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Now, the fact that a person may receive an angelic vision uh, or an angelic visit or vision does not mean the event is something that God has ordained. This is very important to understand. An angelic vision or an angelic visit does not necessarily mean at all that God has ordained it. In fact, Galatians 1, 8, 9 warns us about something like that. Indeed, they can prevent, uh, present a false message, and many times they do. Uh, some of the cults claim they had the leader have had some angelic vision, and this is just not something that uh, we follow because the angels will not give a different gospel, a different message. That's what Paul warns. If an even angel comes and preaches a different message than what we preach, he said, let him be under the divine curse. That's very strong language. All right. Also, they were filled with pride. This is, again, who Paul is writing about in the, to the Colossians. Those who practice angel worship were lifted up with pride. 
Indeed, they considered themselves more holy than anyone else because of their angelic visions. Their pride, in, in turn, brought about a false humility. Though they were pretending to be humble, they were actually, in actuality, arrogant or proud. In other words, they had these visions of angels, it seems, and they, you know, they act as though they're humble, but they're really arrogant because they had something that nobody else had, and they showed their arrogance to the other people there. Now, here's the next point that's crucial. They focused on angels, not Jesus. These people had the wrong focus. They were dwelling on angels instead of the creator of angels, the Lord Jesus. This type of thinking, of course, is not divine, but rather human. And that's why Paul chastised them, as we find in Colossians chapter 2. And of course, as always, it's going to bring about negative results. The worship of angels, therefore, can bring about a number of negative results. It was wrong from the start because it centered on the wrong object, the creation rather than the creator. From the very beginning, the Lord has emphasized that he and he alone is worthy of our worship. We read about this in the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 and 5 reads, Never have any other god. Never make your own carved idols or statues that represent any creature in the sky, on the earth, or in the water. Never worship them or serve them, because I, the Lord your God, am a God who does not tolerate rivals. That's Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 to 5. So angel worship would certainly constitute a rival to the one true God. Again, Exodus 23 to 5, the Ten Commandments. Never worship any other God. Now, here's an interesting question. Uh, some people wonder, is this why the angels remain invisible? One of the possible reasons why angels are invisible to us as human beings, if visible, humans would do what? We would worship them, right? So as long as humanity cannot see angels or directly experience them or contact them, then the chances of angel worship is greatly diminished. All right, so let's summarize this question number 35, should people worship angels? The worship of angels is something that is roundly condemned in scripture. Only God is to be worshipped. The angels of God do not allow themselves to be worshipped. This is important. The angels of God do not allow that, all right? They don't allow direct worship. They always tell people. They, In fact, they say, look, worship God and not not us, to God and him alone. In fact, as we saw on two occasions in the book of Revelation, John the Apostle was actually rebuked by angels when he attempted to worship them. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, he warned about those who, seemingly in their congregation there, who'd worshipped angels. These people who claim to have angelic visions were filled with pride. This is exactly the opposite behavior that a believer in the Lord should exhibit. Furthermore, as we mentioned, worship of, angels, worship of angels distracts us from the true object of our worship, namely the God of the Bible. He and he alone should be worshipped. Indeed, this is emphasized, as we read in the Ten Commandments, where the Lord forbids the worship of anyone or anything apart from him, whether it be in the sky above, the water below, wherever it may be. You don't worship anything but the God of Scripture. So, for a number of reasons, angel worship is something that should never, ever be practiced. All right. Well, how about this question? Should we pray to angels? This is question 36. When we pray, should we ever address our prayers to angels? Can they answer our prayers? And the Bible, again, gives a clear answer to this, and the answer is no. Uh, to whom shall we pray? It's certainly not angels. We're going to observe what the Scripture has to say on this idea. Number one, we are to pray to God alone. The Bible says very clearly that our prayer should be directed to God and to Him alone. When Paul wrote to Timothy about this important truth, he stated it in this manner. There is one God, 1 Timothy 2, 5, very important verse, one God and one intermediary between God and humanity, Christ Jesus himself human, 1 Timothy 2, 5. Note here, only one intermediary or go-between between the human race and God, and that is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. Angels, saints, nobody else can intercede for believers directly to God the Father only the Lord Jesus can do this. It couldn't be said more clearly. 
Number two, only God can help. Angels only serve to do the bidding of God. In fact, as we've read before, and as we've mentioned over and over again, their mission is made clear by the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 1.14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who will inherit salvation? The answer is yes, they certainly are. And so they only go where the Lord sends them. They cannot in and of themselves help us because their power is derived from God. Whenever they come to aid believers in Christ, it is because of the direct command of God. It's not because they've decided to do something. Therefore, it is worthless to call upon angels to help us. Only the Lord can deliver his people. In fact, the psalmist wrote the Lord saying the following, Psalm chapter 50 and verse 15. The Lord says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Psalm chapter 50 and verse 15. God is the only one who can help. This is a biblical truth that you and I should never, ever forget. Indeed, he alone is our help and our strength. Therefore, we should never ask angels to help us. Why? Simply because they cannot. So let's summarize question 36. Should we pray to angels? Um, never in scripture do we find an example of people praying to angels directly to them. Angels are sent to do God's bidding in answer to prayer. Prayers are never directed toward them and never should be. Indeed, there's only one way in which we can have access to God the Father, and that's through the person of Jesus Christ. There's no other way in which an individual can have their prayers answered. None. 1 Timothy 2.5. One God and one intermediary, one go-between between us and God, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. In some, angels do not serve any function as intermediaries between God and humanity in any sense of the word. They do the bidding of God, but only when the Lord sends them. In other words, they never act on their own. So it is worthless to pray directly to them, to ask an angel anything. They cannot help. Please remember this. Angels cannot help you. You don't pray to them. You pray to God the Father through God the Son by means of God the Holy Spirit. You don't pray to angels. You don't pray to saints. You don't pray to anybody but the living God if you want to get your prayers answered. All right. A question 37, one that comes up quite a bit. Do angels appear to people today? Is it possible for angels to appear to human beings today? Should we expect angelic visits? What does the Bible have to say about angels visiting humans? Now, interestingly, our first heading is angels were not immediately recognized on a number of occasions. Um, we found out, and we've been going through this, that angels have appeared in the form of men to such a degree that they were not first identified as angels, even though they were imposing looking figures. Remember the story of Abraham. For example, scripture says that the patriarch Abraham entertained three men as dinner guests in his tent on the plains of Mamre. This is Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 2. It says, the Lord again appeared to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. Uh, one day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them, and he welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. That's Genesis 18, 1 to 2. One angel, we recall the story, remained to talk with Abraham, while the two other angels went down to Sodom to visit his nephew Lot. Now, when they arrived in Sodom, they spent the night with Lot, who at first thought they were just mere men, not heavenly messengers. We read this in Genesis 19. It says, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening while Lot was sitting in the city's gateway. When Lot saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face toward the ground. He said, here, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. Stay the night and wash your feet. Then you can be on your way early in the morning. No, they reply. We'll spend the night in the town square. That's Genesis 19, 1 to 2. Now, Lot thought he was showing hospitality to two men. He was being a gracious host. So he said, just come into my house. You're strangers here. And he wanted to show hospitality uh, toward them. 
So therefore, at the beginning, on each occasion, when Abraham saw the, the three messengers, the three men, when Lot, Lot saw the two that came to Sodom, at first, because they look like men, they're, you know, imposing men, but still men, nevertheless, they hadn't revealed themselves yet as angels and not immediately recognized as angels. And so scripture acknowledges that people have entertained angels without immediately recognizing it or realizing it. And the Bible says this in Hebrews 13, 1 to 2. Let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality. For by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Hebrews 13, 1 to 2. So according to this passage, it was possible for angels to appear to humans without anyone being aware it was actually angels. And as we have noted, this is exactly what happened to Abraham and Lot. Since angels have done this in the past, as we just observed, there is really nothing impossible about this happening today. All right. God works as he desires. Jesus made this very clear that the God of the Bible works as he alone desires. When Jesus spoke to the religious leader Nicodemus, he made the following statement about how the Spirit of God works. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit, John chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore, the visitation of an angel is certainly possible, and here's the big if, though, if, go, if God so desires. Now, this next point cannot be overemphasized. This was not normal in biblical times. We re must recognize that angelic appearances were not normal in the, in the Bible days, not at all. In fact, as we look at the entire scope of biblical history, we find very few examples of angels appearing to humans. In other words, angelic appearances were the exception rather than the rule. Consequently, it's certainly not something that normally happened to biblical characters. Now, the important point is, the activity of angels has been superseded by the work of God the Holy Spirit. There is one final thing that you and I should note. For those who have believed in Jesus Christ, the activity of angels as revealed in the Bible has now been superseded by the work of the Holy Spirit. According to Jesus, he is the one who now guides believers into all truth. In fact, on the night of Jesus' betrayal, the Lord said the following to his disciples, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will tell you what is to come. That's John 16, verses 12 to 13. All right, so while angels still carry on the work of the Lord, for the believer, our guidance comes not from angels, but from God, the Holy Spirit, living inside each and every one of us. In other words, we should not be looking to angels to give us any personal guidance in our lives. All right, so let's sum up question 37. Do angels appear to people today? Now, angelic visits have happened in the past. Scripture records many examples of this. On certain occasions, the people were actually unaware of the angelic appearance. And this is true in the case of Abraham, when the three angels approached him, and the case of Lot, when the two angels first approached him. Initially, they didn't realize it was angels who they were, they were talking to. Now, God works, of course, any way that he desires. Consequently, there's nothing stopping him from sending an angelic visitor to someone today if he so wished. However, we must remember this was not the norm in the biblical times. Indeed, they only appeared to humans on rare occasions, and each time they did appear was at a critical juncture in biblical history. So there's one final thing we want to emphasize here. Today, it is the Holy Spirit of God who guides us as believers, who leads us into the truth of God. Therefore, we should not be looking for angelic guidance or angelic appearances. The role of guiding the believer is the job of God, the Holy Spirit. So here's our conclusion. Therefore, Believers should not expect angels to appear to them. Now, having said this, it is certainly not impossible that the Lord may send an angel to perform some specific tasks for him. 
Therefore, we cannot rule it out. But we should not be looking for this because this is certainly not the norm in biblical times, and it is not the norm today. So bottom line is, um, yeah, angels have appeared in the past to certain people. They certainly have, and they could today if God wanted it. But this is rare, and it's the exception, not the rule. So we should never be looking for to angels for guidance. Our guidance comes from God, the Holy Spirit. He is the one that lives inside each and every one of us. And that's what Jesus promised, and that's what the Bible commands us to do, to be filled or guided or controlled with the Holy Spirit and not look to any type of angelic being for some answer to some question. All right, we're out of time here in this edition of Angels, God's Invisible Messengers. We're up to question 38. Next time, we'll deal with the issue, do believers have a guardian angel? We'll check that out. Again, we thank you for watching. We hope this has been an encouraging time, and this uh, whole series on angels, the good angels, has an awful lot to teach us, doesn't it? And uh, we're very blessed by the fact that God has recorded so much in Scripture about these beings. All right, I'm Don Stewart. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you.